to uh, start the recording. And then what I'll do is I'll, uh, good. if I can find myself here, I will uh, spotlight me so that you guys chattering in the background isn't going to bugger up the video. So we're going to tie the Ray Wallace fly today, uh, named after the inventor who I understand passed away recently. Um, it's basically a bead body fly with some uh, polar chenille wrapped around it. Now, when I heard, uh, heard that this fly had been working well uh, out at uh, Durant's, uh, I'd had to track down what it was. And in my search, I, thanks to Bill, I, I got a look at what it looks like. But in my search, I came across this in my library uh, by Joe Warren, uh, tying glass bead flies. And this was useful because it told me, taught me a few things about techniques for how you do this. So I'm going to show you uh, the, the Joe, uh, the, the Wallace fly to start with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to avoid showing you the pain of having to put the beads on a hook <laughs> because it is a bit of a pain in the butt. I have one thing that really helps a lot. I have this pair of tweezers that have holes in them, makes holding on the beads and threading them on the hook a heck of a lot easier. Um, and the suggestion we had today was to, if you're gonna work on a, a surface, what you wanna have is a piece of cloth or something resilient to put your beads on so they just don't roll off the surface onto the floor, get sucked up by the vacuum. Um, the hook I'm using, for this one is a little longer than the one that you got that, that you guys have seen for the fly that, uh, that Bill has. Um, this would be more like the standard wet fly hook. Uh, and it's about a 2x long. But I'm using one that's a little bit longer, and that's a that's the streamer. I'm sorry, this is this is the shorter one. And this is the longer one. This is a still water and wet, and this is about 3x long which allows you to get five beads on the hook in this size. Now the beads are, that you can get them at the bead store right next to Robinson's and they come in a little vial like this. And you look for them in whatever colors you want. And the sizes that I've yeah. been oh, yeah. playing with, can I get like oh, yeah. hook, size, hook sizes, there's a six aught and an eight aught. And these ones are six aught beads. I just transferred them all of the different colors into a little container I got at Michael's. Uh, so I've got some six aught and some eight aught in various varieties. Um, so what I do is I thread with my tweezers, I thread five of these beads onto the hook chain. Now, the trick here is to place the beads so that you can wind the chenille through in between the beads without difficulty. Uh, I did, the, the pattern originally called for a uh, polar chenille in sort of a medium size. And this is the regular polar chenille. So this particular one, if you look at it, it's a little on the long side. The one that Bill had there a little shorter, but I'll, I'll do it with this one because that's what I have. I didn't find any uh, medium polar chenille. Uh, so I'll do it in this one. What you do with the thread is, if, if, you, if you just put your hook in the vise the first time, the suggestion in the book was to tilt it down so the beads slide right up to the front when you're trying to get started. And then you tie in right at the bend of the hook, uh, on the, just right where it's bending almost horizontal when you've got a pointed nose down. And then, you trim that off. And I catch my polar chenille. This is a fairly straightforward thing. I get polar chenille. And what I'll do with this polar chenille is I will expose the end of the core a little bit. <coughs> and I'll tie it right down on the bend, just a teeny little bit that protrudes. 
right back to the bend of the hook, just actually slightly around the bend. And I'll connect that onto my material clip so it's out of the way. At that point now, I know beads are not gonna slide off the ass end of the hook, so I'm gonna turn it up so that the shaft of the hook is horizontal. Here, it's all straightforward. The first thing I do is I pull with my thumb and forefinger the last bead back towards where I've tied in the chenille, almost right smack on the bend. And I go underneath it and make a couple of wraps in front. Make two or three wraps on the shank. So there's a little gap, probably less than a, probably 16th of an inch, maybe a little less. Pull the next bead back and wrap in front of it from underneath over the top. So now you see I've got a little, whoops, let's get that there. One, two. Now you see you've got a little gap in between the two beads. I'll do the same thing, I'll wrap the thread forward, pull that bead back from underneath over top, and I'll wrap that one. So again, I've got another gap. And then wrap forward a little bit, do the same thing with the other bead, and wrap in front. And I'll leave the, the front bead, I'll do the same thing, a little bit of a gap, but I'm gonna pull it back from the eye of the hook because I wanna be able to put a head on this thing. And at that point, I will throw a half inch onto the eye, just behind the eye. And bring my bobbin holder out and get that out of the way. Because I'm going to use the rotary feature on the vise to make this work. Pull the chenille, and I will pull this away towards me, stroke it away for me a little bit. Make one, two wraps in behind the last bead. Then I'll bring the, the polar chenille body underneath, in between the two beads, up to the top, in between, and go down the other side, just to, it's now in between those two beads. I'll rotate it over and do two wraps in between. And I'll do the same thing on the next one. Up over down, get it one, two, sometimes three, depends on the gap. And then up and over and down the other side. One, two, and then the last one. Up over and from underneath, up over the top and down the far side. One, two. And the last one I'm gonna do is just in front of the front bead, pull it back, up over, down, and do another wrap or two. And I will tie off in behind, one, two, three, pull this all back from the eye of the hook so it's clear and wrap one, two, three in front. And then turn the polar chenille out. Again, pull it back, make a little head right behind the eye of the hook, just to hold everything in place. And get my whip finisher. Again, you gotta make sure you keep this stuff held back when you're doing the whip finish. You end up with a bunch of little stragglers poking out the front. And I'll just pull that in. And I'll do a double whip finish. And that's basically it. Now you can see it's kind of scraggly. This is because this polar chenille is pretty long. And, 
and some of it gets trapped when you're doing the wrapping. So I just take my little Velcro tool and make sure all the legs are sticking out. Now this one is not as bulky as some of them. You see, because I, it's this normal long polar chenille, I'm going to do it, give it a haircut because it sticks out a long way. So I'll just go around trimming this stuff a little shorter. You can you can play around with that to your heart's content. Depends on how bulky you want it. So that's the basic gray Wallace fly. There you go. Not much to it. Now I played around with that some more and I decided to try a little bit different color just for the heck of it. So now I've got one that's got uh, some metallic beads and I'll do the same thing. I'll start at the back, right at the bend and wrap back over so I got the thread tied in. <laughs> and this time I'm going to use a, uh, a regular crystal chenille for the body. And this will make it a much more compact fly. So I need to expose again that little thread at the beginning of the ins inside of the chenille, just so I can tie it in without making a big bump at the back. Put that in the material clip and do the same thing here. Make a little bit of a space, bring the beads back, a couple wraps in front. Going to leave a little more space in between the beads this time because the chenille here is a little wider. So right up to the where I want to tie the bead in. So what happens is the thread when you wrap forward on the shank keeps the bead from sliding back. So I wrap forward to where you want it to be, wrap in front. That'll keep it there. And the same thing, I want to leave a little space at the front because this chenille is a little bulkier. And do the half hitch. So you can see this happens fairly quick. My bobbin out of the way. And this time I'm gonna, because this stuff tends to go a little flat uh, out of the package, I'm gonna twist it so that it's nice and round. Do a couple of wraps right behind that last bead. And then again, in front of, between the two. And then in front between the next one. Sometimes you gotta use your thumbnail to get it in that gap. And then same thing here. And then I'll do the same thing at the front. And pull it up. Wrap it behind. Pull it back, make sure the eye is clear. off the chenille. And so basically you've got kind of like a woolly worm arrangement with the beads in the middle. Depending on the color of beads and the color of chenille you want to use, this gives you a whole bunch of options on what your fly might look like. There you go, there's a, there's a little woolly worm tied with a bead body. And when this gets wet, those beads will show through pretty well. 
Now, you can even make it more interesting. I've got some here I'll show you. So there's one that uses a, a, a longer crystal chenille, and that's got those uh, metallic beads. So you can play with colors and beads. The other thing I've done is I've done one where I've kept that skinny body and I put a uh, mer marabou tail with the bead body and that chenille. And then I've used a, uh, a cheap pen hackle in the front to give it a, a front hackle. And I've used one less bead on the body and I put the red bead at the very front. So it's like a similar to like an egg sucking leech kind of arrangement. So using those beads is, is uh, gives you an, an option of tying a whole bunch of bead body flies that represent different things. The other thing I've tied is a few that are in this smaller size that use this eight aught beads on a much shorter hook. And I've used this uh, micropolar chenille. Now, what I think these would be good for is uh, you get in the, in the lakes around here, you'll get these cased caddis, the caddises or uncased caddises. So this would be a good caddis larva fly. You could tie that in a variety of colors with that little spiky stuff because caddis build their, their cases with little bits of stones and, and uh, debris. And I think you could probably tie a whole whack of these in a couple of different sizes using the smaller beads. Um, and then if you want really fuzzy, I've used some gel spun <laughs> stuff and it makes a really fuzzy body. So uh, you could play around with that with colors and make some interesting flies. So that was the, that was the reason for, for undertaking something beyond just the basic Ray Wallace fly. The last thing in the book, which I'm not gonna do this week, which, but which, oh, let me, let me do this other one first, sorry. Um, the other fly pattern that I've seen these beads used for is a uh, scud, which is basically a freshwater shrimp. Now this is on a scud hook, and I've used uh, three uh, greenish yellow beads and one red one. This, this is the, for the so-called pregnant scud. And I'm going to use green thread for that one. Again, I, I want to tie here right around the bend of the hook because it's going to be bent around like a scud. They have that curved shape to them. Tie in at the back. Now, the back, shell back, I've used, you've used this stuff before, which is scud back eighth inch wide and I've got it with this at uh, Robinson's. You don't want to keep this stuff in inventory for too long because it gets a little on the brittle side. But what I, I do with this one is I'll select a little piece here right at the tip. I, I cut a little point. You can see there's a little point there. I trimmed that little point and I'll lay it down right at the bend of the hook and tie the point down. Come on. Ah, get on there. I'm having troubles with this this morning. There you go. Get hold it down with my thumb, not a lyric. Tie it right around the bend and put that in the material clip. And I'm going to use this uh, micro polar chenille again in olive. And it's, uh, now one of the things I discovered with this micro polar chenille, <laughs> and this is a, probably a good, a good thing to discover before you start playing with it. With the other chenilles, I, I pull the end off to expose the core of the chenille so it's easy to tie down. However, with this micropolar chenille, if you do that, it will unwind all the way down here and you'll end up with a fistful of little wee bits of colored material and a bare string. 
So I don't pull the end off on this one. I just put the end down on the hook and tie it down right back to where the stretch flex flex is. And hold that there. And I'll do the same thing here. I'm gonna bring this bead back as far as I can get it and wrap in front of it. And then I'll do the same thing with the middle bead. Not a lot of room because this micropolar chenille is pretty fine. And do the same thing with this one. Pull it back. And then pull this one back and tie in the front. And again, I'll do the half hitch. Where's my half hitch tool? This is a little easier with the tool because it's a small eye. There you go. So this time I'm just going to take the uh, micropolar chenille and I will do a couple of wraps in behind the beads. And again, this one I want to twist a little bit to make sure the fibers stick out in between. And then in between. And in between. And then I want to pull that front one back and make a wrap in front. And that's because it's a little bit tight to the eye of the hook. So I'm going to push that back from the eye. And the usual thing here, tie it down in behind a couple of times, back, tie a couple of times in front. And because there's a tendency with these curved hooks to get the, the thread will slip over the eye, you just gotta readjust the hook in the vise a little bit. I'll take my stretch floss over the top and pull it forward right on top, hold it with my fingers on top of the hook, pinch the eye and stretch it just enough it goes over those beads and stays on top of the hook. A couple of three wraps in between my thumbnail and the bead. Pull the fresh frost back in front. Just make sure the uh, it's clear of the eye. Pull up on and stretch the floss up and trim it off. And we'll finish. And there's your scud. This is the pregnant scud version, which is what the little red bead is all about. And if these little fibers don't stick out, once again, you use your little popsicle stick with the Velcro on it, and you can pull those things so that they hang out and down a little bit. And that gives you a nice looking little Little scud. So that's it for me in terms of tying. That just gives you the basic information for how to get that basic body done using a, a variety of materials. And uh, in some, you can put a tail on them and you can make them as bulky or as not so fuzzy as you want. Um, the last thing I, I, I looked up, which I'm going to show you is uh, this is the, the beginning of the next phase, which I might do in a couple of weeks. The, sh the book shows extended body flies. 
that have a bead body with a extended tail that's made up of a whole bunch of these little micro beads, this, these eight odd ones. And in the book, they tell you to use uh, that wire, the fishing wire with a little sleeve on the end. I did, don't have any. So I just got some 25 pound mono and tied a knot in it and put a tail, made a loop, put the some gel and fritz through the tail to make a bit of a, the loop to make a bit of a tail. And then just tied that mono in on the hook shank and put the bead bodies on. So what's going to happen after this, I have to do a little bit more experiment, but I'm going to turn this into a, a bucktail fly. I'm going to make some bucktails that extend basically from the eye of the hook most of the way back to the tail. Uh, so I've left a fair bit of room between the front bead and the eye of the hook because I'm going to need to tie the, the bucktail down there. So there's lots of experiments experiments to try with these beads and I think you should have a go at it. So I'll stop my recording or uh, yeah, I'll stop. I'll leave, leave it recording, but I'm done now. I'll stop the highlight. Looks good, Dave. Some nice um, <clears throat> uh, variations on uh, using beads. Yeah, I, I, I just seeing the book and going through it said, you know, I, I remember that book, but I didn't do a lot with it. so. It's given me the incentive to play around with it a bit. And I think you can have some fun. So, oh, and there's one that I haven't tried yet, which, I, which I'm gonna try. It's this guy here. It's called the Sultry Shiner. And it uses uh, about three or four glass beads on the body. And you tie in front with a, a dumbbell eye or you put eyes on it. And then you just tie in uh, fish hair in different colors, pull it back. And from what I understand, you pinch the back together here with your fingers, wrap the thread around and then whip it around to make the tail and then trim the tail off. So I'm gonna give that a go this week and see if I can make this uh, shiner type fly. Because that looks like that would be an interesting fly to try on some coho. There you go. So, Florin, you're up. Thank you, Dave. So, here is a little fly. So, this is this is a, a wet fly or a nymph. Can you guys actually see this? Because my computer seems to be. Yep, we can see it. Yep. Good. Okay, so let's let's hope that my my camera here is not about to crash. <clears throat> All right, it's not the camera, but the software that runs the camera. So I'm tying these things on shorter shank wet fly hooks. So I'm trying to basically get roughly a size 12 fly on a size 10 hook, which is what I have in the vise right now. And these are, these are the Togans hooks. That's what they look like. They're fairly, fairly heavy wire, as you can see. So this is, if you fish this as a nymph, it's not going to need any extra, any extra weight. I'm using uh, eight odd thread. And this is a fairly simple fly with very few, actually very few ingredients. Um, for the tail and the hackle, I'm using the same, I'm using the same material. So this is some hen hackle and um kind of a kind of a done this this particular one that i have is a it's almost like a pale grizzly done i would call it almost you know it's got a bit of barring to it um but i don't think that's the the main thing is you want some some grayish stuff and you can vary the you can vary the color i think on this based on the same idea i don't see any reason to, to stick just to this color combination, but it's 
I kind of like the uh, the combo with the with the peacock curl. So that's the version I'm gonna do today. You can you can go to something more brown if you want. You know, you can use some of those um, hand um, hand saddle patches that have really nice soft fibers or for tails, for example. And then the body. So just a little clump of fibers for the tail. And then for the body, I'm going to take two relatively fine strands of peacock curl. Make sure that the ends are properly, properly trimmed. You want to get rid of, of this brittle stuff as much as possible. And for this, because I want a relatively slender body, I wouldn't want to use prime quality hurl from a full tail feather. I'd rather go with, I have some bundled, uh, bundled stuff that's just not, you know, very, very fluffy, but you can take two, three strands and then you can do a nice, a nice rope with them. And, uh, it's, it's easy to work with and you can, you can achieve more slender outcomes than, than with the alternative. So what I do is the usual, um, the usual dubbing loop here. And the only thing I need to be really careful with is that I don't over tension at this stage because the risk here is to break the peacock. So what I've done is I have two strands of two strands of peacock and the thread loop all caught in my rotary hackle pliers. I use those to twist the rope and this reinforces the uh, the peacock curl so well that I never had trouble breaking it off on a not when I tie when I tie I still sometimes if I pull a little too hard uh, the peacock curl can break but once once the fly is completed the thread holds the peacock in place very, very nicely. And even repeated chewing by trout will not, will not ruin this. The downside of course, is if you prefer to have something a lot fluffier, um, doing these dubbing loops with peacock curl is not going to give you that super fluffy thing. You get a much more compact body. You can vary this technique. You can use, I've tried it, for example, using a strand of um, silver crystal flash. And it gives you a peacock curl with a bit of, uh, see, now this got loose out of the loop. Now I have to make sure I put it back in. Okay, there is good enough. I don't need to go much further. trim. I've got a little bit of thread sticking out here, but just do some tidy up thread, thread wraps. Okay. So there's the, the body and the tail. And now comes the main ingredient of this fly, which are these little aftershaft feathers that you get from a golden pheasant neck. So these little guys, they're at the base of your pheasant tippets. If you ever tied with golden pheasant tippet, you're gonna find these little things at the base of the thread. And so what I've done is I, I took, um, and these things basically come like whole pieces of, of golden pheasant neck. And so you take one of those things and you basically start taking it apart to separate the pheasant tippet from these, from these little guys. And this is what the feathers look like. Now, the stem on these feathers is pretty hard and it's quite round. So the other thing that I, I do in order to 
the aim here is to have this feather lie flat on the back of the fly. And so an easy way to achieve that, or at least a step in the right direction, is to use your debarbing pliers and flatten that stem. <clears throat> and this, uh, I was reading through some books on, you know, doing various things with, you know, salmon flies and stuff like that. And um, it turns out that this is a fairly standard trick that's used by tires of fancy flies to get their feathers to stay where they want them to stay. So here you just want to position your feather and while holding it in place, secure with a few wraps of thread. And you're trying to get this feather to line up with the end of your tail. So probably on this yeah, flight, so I, I, I could have done the tail just a little shorter. Okay, if there is any any excess waste here, just trim anything. Yeah, that's good. And then for hackle, this is just from the same cape where I where I got the uh, the fibers for the tail. This is a I try to prepare these things ahead of time and size them up. <clears throat> so this is fairly standard stuff. Okay. Now I switch to the other hackle pliers. That we were talking about earlier and this is a this is a soft hackle so you want to fold this back a little bit so that the fibers line up nicely so moistening the fingers a little bit helps okay. one wrap Second wrap in front of the first one. And there's a bit of a matter of personal preference. I'm just going to go and do a third wrap. Secure with two or three turns here. Move the thread in front and trim the hackle. Okay. Now it's just a matter of whip finishing and cleaning up any mess that may be left behind. Make sure that all the fibers are back so nothing gets trapped here at the head. Build a little head and a couple of whip finishes, so I don't have to use any any lacquer or anything on that head. One, two, three, four. There we go. And that's the fly. Now, normally, I suppose you'd be doing this. If you're tying a bunch of flies with pheasant tippets, and there are many varieties of those, I'm kind of doing this backwards. And so now that I've gone through my golden pheasant tippet feathers, and I've done a lot of, of cleanup, now I have crest feathers, I have tippet feathers, and I have this little aftershaft feathers. So I'm thinking next time I'm going to try to tie something with the pheasant tippets. Anyway. For this fly, you can you can think of variations, change the color of the hackle, change the uh, the body material to some dubbing of your your favorite color, and uh, give it a try. I would fish this both lakes and 
and streams probably go smaller in streams bigger in lakes and if you catch any fish with it let me know Oh, that was a nice, nice Lauren.